for all conditions. If you look at men and women, if they have diabetes, they're three times more likely to die from heart disease, no matter what they do. The only piece of good news is this study done in the New England Journal in 2002 that looked at uh, people who were at risk of developing diabetes, and they randomized these people to three different groups. They gave one group of people that should have been. One group, they gave a diabetes medicine that has been shown to prevent diabetes. And in the third group, they said, here's your diet. I want you to exercise 30 minutes four times a week. And they followed them for four years. And you can see that the rate of developing diabetes if you did nothing is 58% in this group. If you took the medication, the rate of developing diabetes is 31%. And if you adhere just to lifestyle changes and didn't take medication, the rate of developing diabetes was 19%. So diabetes can be prevented, which is probably the single most important thing that we need to know from this slide. We're going to talk a little about stress and heart disease, um, and stress and, and women in heart disease. This is the first report of a cardiomyopathy a weakening of the heart muscle provoked by stress in women in the United States is published in the journal Circulation. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's called, you may have heard of it, it's called uh, broken heart syndrome or sad heart syndrome. Or the real name is stress-induced cardiomyopathy or Takasubo's cardiomyopathy. But this is a picture of the main pumping chamber of the heart. And there's a, a catheter in here that you really can't see very clearly. Um, the catheter is injecting dye into the main pumping chamber. Uh, and this is before the heart beats, and this is when the heart beats. So you can see in this instance that this is the base of the heart, and this is the apex of the heart. The base of the heart is squeezing normally, and the rest of the heart is just ballooning out. The other name for this syndrome is called apical ballooning syndrome. And this is purely a response to some sort of severe emotional stress, fatal at times, and seen almost exclusively in women. This is an example of just an MRI sequence. These are relaxation of the heart pictures in uh, people with stress-induced cardiomyopathy and then normal patients. And then when the heart beats, you can see the muscle here compared to here thickens in normal people. And in people with stress-induced cardiomyopathy, it actually doesn't thicken and bows outward. So what kinds of stresses are life or death like the loss of us? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, let me get to it right here. So this is, this is actually the first group of patients characterized in the New England Journal immediately after that circulation article. Neurohormonal fe features of myocardial stunning due to sudden emotional stress. New England Journal, famous art, famous journal. Um, this is another same picture. And you can see that in people with stress-induced cardiomyopathies, this is an MRI sequence. There is no scar. This is all what muscle looks like on MRI. And it looks the same kind of gray density. In people with heart attacks, there is a very bright scar. This is scarring and, and permanent damage of the, of the heart muscle. In the cardiomyopathies, you don't have permanent damage. You have transient damage that goes away as the stressor goes away. So this is the list of 19 patients who have this condition. Uh, and you can see the patients are numbered here. Their age is given here, and they, they range anywhere from 27 to 77. And you can see they are almost all women. There is one man in this group. All right. And if you look a little further, you look at the emotional stressors. Sorry about the surprise. <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. That is why that my wife will never have a surprise party as long as she lives. And that's my excuse. Um, yeah. It's one surprise party and uh, some other, some other um, interference. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. right. Interference. But most of them are deaths. I'm sorry? Sure, sure. Um, mother's death, car accident, surprise reunion, <laughs> right? Surprise party, father's death, husband's death, friend's death, father's death, mother's death, fear of procedure, which is an interesting one. Fierce argument, friend's death, court appearance, fear of choking, public speaking. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, husband's death, armed robbery. Uh, son's death and tragic news. So, usually some sort of. When someone asks a question, do you mind just repeating it into the mic? So the oh, sure. Thank you. Yes, I should do that. Thank you. I forgot to do that. So, that's um, one link to stress and heart disease that is not coronary artery disease. 
most of the data on psychological stress and psychosocial stress uh, comes from a number of European studies. And this is the biggest one, 11,000 patients and 13,000 controls. They took people that were matched for age, for sex, for gender, for uh, occupation. They matched them as best they could. And they asked them to classify their stressors, whether they were work stress, home stress, financial stress, or major life issues. And they just followed these people for years. And they found that people who classified themselves as having one or more stressors were four times more likely to have heart disease and have heart events, whether it's a stress-induced cardiomyopathy, sudden death, uh, other conditions, other cardiomyopathies that are unexplained, or heart attacks. Another case. Cardiovascular events during the World Cup. This is actually true of the Super Bowl, too. Viewing a stressful soccer match more than doubles the risk of acute cardiovascular event. In fact, in this article, the, uh, the authors actually said that they need to have preventive measures. I don't even know what those preventive measures would be, but they need to take preventive measures when the World Cup is on. I don't even know what they would do, but something like that, right? Overtime work. Overtime work associated with an increased risk of developing heart disease. Being on call 24 hours as a doctor associated with an increased risk of heart disease. In fact, this is one of the reasons that the, uh, the laws have changed for physician work hours uh, in you know, Australia and in the UK, way before they changed here, but uh, they finally changed here too, uh, that people were developing stress-induced cardiomyopathies and heart disease working 24-hour shifts. Now, we don't really know why this happens, but stress leads to direct biological effects, physical strain, hormonal changes, it leads to maladaptive coping, coping behaviors such as smoking or eating excessively, drinking excessive alcohol. And then there are emotionally mediated effects on diet and activity levels. And they all lead to increased risk of disease. The body's response to stress is usually one of three, a set of three different phases. The first phase is an acute alarm phase where you kind of, everyone knows what it feels like when you feel stressed. You get dry mouth, your hands get sweaty, you feel your heart racing. Uh, over time, as you get used to the same stressor, your body develops a kind of a tolerance and an a acceptance of that level of stress. And that's where most people are. They're in high states of, of psychosocial stress and they've kind of learned to resist uh, those effects on their body because they couldn't have that same kind of effect for the extended period of time. Eventually, over time, the theory is that the energy sources become depleted uh, and uh, the ability to resist stressors goes down. So psychosocial stress and heart disease is very important because um, there are many different kind of impacts on psychosocial stress. Psychosocial stress in and of itself is a predictor for heart disease. It is highly preventative and people know it but they won't go and seek the care they need to because usually the stress is preventing them from going and doing something else. Uh, stress in and of itself causes a barrier to medical interventions uh, and commonly masquerades as heart symptoms. I see 10 to 15 patients a week who come see me for chest pain or palpations and always stress. Um, let's talk a little more about psychosocial stress and what I mean about it. And it's grouped into two big uh, categories. One are emotional factors. The other are chronic stressors. So we'll talk about emotional factors first. Uh, the first is depression. This is a study looking at people who had a heart attack. And they classified themselves into four different categories based on a depression index. The higher the number, the more they were depressed. And you can see that this is on the y-axis, the survival, or survival, actually. Uh, and this is days on the uh, x-axis. And for any given increase in quartile of depression index, they had an increased risk of mortality. In fact, that risk, clinical depression, if you were actually classified as being clinically depressed, is a higher risk than diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, or age. 2.69% uh, sorry, 2.69 times more likely to have a second event. Hostility index. Hostility index is uh, an interesting, I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, one day, uh, we were looking to, I was actually looking to park my car near my apartment. Anyone who drives in New York has parked his car for a premium. 
I saw a spot, cut across, was ready to park into my spot. And then, of course, someone else drives in to park in, drive into the spot. So I'm in front trying to parallel back in. The person in front is trying to go in. So source being the, uh, the type A personality and hothead I am, I get out of the car and say, what are you doing? This is my spot. Um, out comes a very big, very tall, very strong looking man <laughs> who is not happy that I've gotten out of my car, seemingly threatening him. He gets out, starts yelling at me, hits the back of my, hood, of my trunk. Next thing you know, the back windshield broken. Very high hostility index. <laughs> Needless to say, I lost the parking spot. And uh, that kind of anger, if you've ever seen it, you are one of those people that walks in the street and um, gets pissed off at people walking too slowly, kind of muttering under your breath. Uh, yeah, you're those people. You are classified as having a high hostility index. And if you do or do not have heart disease, you are at more risk for it. 20% increase risk of heart disease. So even if you're just angry, for any reason. Yeah, there is. <laughs> um, this is something I find really interesting. Type A personality and heart disease, first described by two doctors, Friedman and Rosamond, described as a continuous, deeply ingrained struggle to overcome real and imagined obstacles imposed by events, other people, and especially time. Initially, it was called the hurry sickness. Now, I don't imagine there's a lot of this at Google, but there's a... <laughs> This seems like a very relaxed, nice place to work. But where I, <laughs> where I work, we're all type A. Is that right? Is that right? Well, look, they're, they're considered to be impatient, competitive, easily irritated, hostile. The, the, the initial description of type A, competitive, suspicious, and quick to anger. Obviously, they're very highly successful. Those behaviors make them highly successful. However, they are not highly successful to themselves, which is part of the problem. So there is one study that looks at type A personality uh, and the risk of developing heart disease. And they found that there's a 50% increase in coronary events over eight years if you are type A. And it is a good predictor of a second event if you've already had a first event. This is confirmed in large-scale population studies. The Framingham study is probably the biggest large-scale study that looks at uh, heart disease. This was confirmed in that group of co cohort of patients as well. And I think this is probably the most important thing. You know, obviously, uh, as you know, I have a, uh, a young daughter. And I'm, I'm, I'm so type A that um, <laughs> when she eats, I've got a uh, paper towel in my hand. So I'm always <laughs> wiping her hands and, like, wiping the table and wiping the floor. So now she has taken to grabbing the paper towel and just start cleaning wherever she is. So I tried to figure out if type A personality was inherited or taught. Right, interesting question, right? So Karen Matthews, the University of Pittsburgh, noticed a striking parallels between type A adults and type A children. I'm just going to read the paragraph. I think it's interesting. Type A behavior may develop as a result of child-rearing practices in which parents and strangers alike urge children to achieve at higher and higher levels, but give them ambiguous standards for evaluating their performance. The example is, you're doing fine, but next time try harder. This leaves a child frustrated without a sense of belonging in mistrustful society. I think that may be a little much, but uh, moreover, there seems to be a snowball effect. Children react to the combination of positive evaluation, you're doing well, and urging of improvement next time try harder by becoming more competitive. In term, competitive and patient children elicit more positive evaluation and urging. So I find that to be very interesting. This, the structure of American classroom with its reward system, its competitiveness, and its hourly bells can be seen to encourage such behavior in children whose home environment makes them susceptible. So I'm worried for Zia. <laughs> This is another thing I find very interesting as uh, an area of interest, uh, an area of research for me now, is um, chronic stressors as they relate to work stress. So there are two models for work stress. And again, this probably doesn't exist at Google, but exists a lot at, at the hospital. There is the job strain model, uh, which is very popular in the United States, and looked at, looks at job latitude as it relates to job demands. So if you have very high job demands, but you have high job latitude, you don't have someone micromanaging you, that's not considered to be something that causes increased stress. However, if you have high job demands and low work latitude, that's considered to cause job strain and increases your risk of physical illness. Makes sense, but uh, it's interesting that it's been studied. 
In Europe, they, they look much more at a reward uh, effort model. So if you look at effort, either low or high, and job reward, low or high, if you're high effort, high reward, that's not dangerous. But if you're high effort, low reward, that's job imbalance. And again, increases the risk of physical illness. Marital stress. This does not apply to me. Um, so this is, this is a group of women um, who are classified in three different groups, either satisfied and married, unmarried, or not satisfied in their, or lowly satisfied in their marriage. And the y-axis looks at plaque scores within heart arteries. So you can see that if you are happily married, you are at lower risk than if you are not happily married. The unmarried people are somewhere in between, but not statistically significantly different than the married happy people. In addition, the development of further plaques over the next two years is much more likely to occur if you remain in an unhappy or a low satisfaction marriage. Interesting. Okay, we've talked a lot about stress, heart disease, problems. How do we modify risk? I will stop for a second and, and take questions if there are any. If not, I'll keep going. Yes? You, you show, you're talking about stress and um, stress events like your public speaking. And if you're repeatedly exposed to that kind of stress, then your physical reaction will decrease. Does that mean that they're no longer stressed or someone's no longer stressed? Or does it just mean that your body can't react to it? Uh, the question was, um, if someone is repeatedly exposed to a stressor, such as uh, public speaking, uh, usually they adapt. Does that mean they're no longer stressed, or, or have they adapted? The question, the answer is, people have adapt. They adapt to their environments, and they no longer perceive that stress in the same way. But they are still as stressed. Their body is still as taxed. They just don't recognize it. It's like um, it's, the example I give you is, if you were to have a kind of a, a background ringing noise in your office. You might find it annoying for the first day, two days, three days. If it remained there, it would probably still be annoying to you, but your level of perception would decrease and you wouldn't notice it as much. Uh, so it's similar for that. Yes? Very good for you. I'll get to it. <laughs> I have annuals. I have physicals here and there, and uh, I'm pretty much clean, right? Very mm -hmm. healthy. But I still, after looking at this, I still have this fear of heart disease, heart attack, if my dad's one day or whatever. Um, so, are you going to talk about what we should do if, if we're worried about these things, but we still are are getting a clean bill of health from our doctors? Um, it's not part of the talk, but I'm happy to talk to you offline about it. Um, there are um, a lot of new, newer techniques on the, and this is something that, uh, you know, being part of a wellness and prevention center, we focus on a lot of um, newer techniques to sub, to identify subclinical disease, disease that doesn't give you symptoms but is there, and the extent of that disease, based on age match controls, will say if you are at high risk or there are ways to kind of see uh, whether or not you're in that quartile of people that have subclinical disease but don't have symptoms yet. Okay. Yeah. Um, what steps are taken if you have um, a history of heart disease and things like that in your family and like, as a physician what's up to you to monitor your patients? So the, the question is, what steps uh, are taken if you have a history of a family history of heart disease? And that's a really good question because I think that is one of the flaws in current risk assessment for cardiovascular disease. If you look at all the mod, and this is not to get too technical, but if you look at all the modeling for cardiovascular risk, uh, the big studies for women, there's a, a score called the Reynolds Risk Score. You can look it up online. It's uh, it's validated more in women than the Framingham Risk Score, which is actually based on a population in Framingham, Massachusetts. Middle-aged white male population doesn't apply to most of us in this room. So um, they have these models, but none of them incorporate family history into the model because it's very hard to model something so heterogeneous. So in that group of people, the family history group of people, I think there needs to be what 
what's happening now is um, some sort of atherosclerotic imaging, imaging to look for the precursor of cholesterol buildup. And so that's what I usually do. That's I'm on the writing uh, committee guidelines that are coming out next year for that as a AHA statement, and that's what will be advocated. It's not advocated yet, but it, it will be the next year. Okay, yes, I will uh, keep going. Modification of risk, okay. Um, this is probably the most important slide. Uh, multifaceted approach to modification of your risk for developing disease and risk for having some sort of body reaction to stress, not just coronary artery disease, blocked arteries, but body, physical and mental breakdown from stress is best approached through a multifaceted way. Whether it's dietary changes, or this regular, moderate physical activity, smoking cessation people who smoke, maintaining an optimal weight, or really body mass index, not weight, uh, moderate alcohol consumption, and behavioral modification to reduce stress. I will go through each one of these quickly and uh, in a little more detail. But this is a slide looking at the importance of a multifaceted approach. Um, on the x-axis here is the number of protective factors. And here are, there's three, four, and five. If you look at the table on the left, three protective factors, Oops, sorry. Um, if you didn't smoke, you had a healthy diet, whatever that means, and regular exercise, you reduced your risk for developing heart disease by 50 to 60 percent. If you incorporated <clears throat> a healthy body weight, it dropped to 66 percent. Oh, sorry, it increased 66 percent. And if you incorporated moderate alcohol use, moderate, the key word is moderate, I'll get to what moderate is, your percent reduction goes to 83 percent. So the more different things you do, yes, 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 I agree. The more different things you do, the better off you are. So let's talk a little about diet. Um, so this is a slide that talks about structuring your meals. Practical advice. If you can either plan your meals or have a single meal replacement, I'd love to go to this, um, this juice place uh, on first and first. What's the name? Juice Press. Juice Press. Sorry, Juice Press. For those of you who live in New York. Um, and she will often use that as a meal replacement, a lunch replacement. That has been shown, and this is a study to prove it, that that works better or as well than if you plan your meal. So if you say, I'm going to eat this this day, that that day, this that day. You plan your diet out for the week. That's as good as taking one day or one meal a day and having a meal replacement. It has to be something reasonable, whether it's whatever. It used to be slim fast, uh, but it can be you know juicing. It can be whatever you want it to be as a meal replacement. As long as it is planned, it is much better than kind of winging it for lunch. If you plan your food, you're much more likely to lose weight, keep the weight off. This is a slide looking at um, the nurses' health. This is the largest cohort of women. Um, and it's women because it started in the 60s where it was 99.4% female nurses. Uh, uh, looking at the nursing health study and looking at fruit and vegetable intake per day and risk for heart disease. So obviously, we all know that people tell you to eat a lot of fruit and vegetables and you want to have heart disease. This is where it comes from. This is the group of patients that go from three to eight servings of fruit and vegetable a day. And you can see your risk for developing heart disease drops about 20%. This is a similar slide, same group of patients, um, in terms of dietary fiber, whole grain and fiber. The more fiber you eat, the more your risk of heart disease goes down. What about different diets? There's so many out there. We all know most of them. Ornish diet, which is made very popular by Dean Ornish, a very, very low-fat diet. It's a vegetarian diet. Almost all the, the protein comes from vegetarian sources, almost no meat. Pritkin diet, which is a, is a, a variant of the, Orkin, of the Ornish diet. Then there are the intermediate uh, fat diets, sugar buster, zone, et cetera. And the low-carb diets, which we all know about, Atkins, South Beach, slow-carb, uh, and then calorie restriction diets, right, Weight Watchers. Which one of these is better, long-term, short-term? Well, here's the data, okay? This is one study, 160 patients, randomized to four diets. This is kind of old study, but I'll get you the more new, newer studies in a minute. Atkins, Zone, Weight Watchers, and Ornish. So Ornish is low fat. Weight Watchers is a point system based on calories, which is pretty easy to follow. Zone is moderate carbohydrate, and Atkins is low carb. 
high meat, high animal protein source. Sorry. And you can see the weight loss is essentially the same. There's really no statistical difference between seven pounds and five pounds. Uh, the problem is most people couldn't stand a diet, which is what you find with most diets. Right? So no real difference. Hard to sustain. You can see that 26 out of 40 stay on the diet. Even people who are enrolled into a study, they're, they're people who are motivated to stay on diets and even they can't stand the diet. So if you were to take it to the general population, it'd be less. This is a study looking at high fat, protein, or carbs. We have either high carb or low carb diets, high fat or low fat diets, high protein and low protein diets. None of them make a difference in terms of your weight loss, in terms of change in your weight circumference. They're all kind of the same. They're the same. There's one controversial study. This is, this is just uh, the same thing uh, in a different table, table form. This is uh, the carbohydrates at 65%, the square is 55, the circle is 45, the diamond is 35. There's really no difference whether you eat a high carb or low carb diet long term in terms of weight loss, in terms of waist circumference. This is the single study that throws a wrench into all of that. This is a, a study published in the New England Journal in 2008, and it looks at three different diets, a low fat diet, a Mediterranean diet, which I'll get to, and a low carb diet, and that low carb diet it's a diet where it's less than 30% of your calories from carbohydrates. So you really have to restrict all the carbs you eat. Um, and this is months on the x-axis, so it goes out two years, and this is weight loss. And you can see that for a given time, you lose more weight with a low-carb diet, and you're more likely to keep it off compared to a low-fat diet. This is the single study that shows it. There's no difference between low-carb and Mediterranean, but there is a difference between both and a low-fat diet. So this is where the whole low-carb movement came from. Uh, everyone said, oh, this is the way to go. Uh, this is the study that proves it. This is a very controversial study and the only study that shows it. This is, a, in my mind, a more important study. This is 605 people. It's called the Lyon Diet Heart Study. It's probably the most famous and most quoted heart uh, diet study. Uh, 605 patients who had an event, had a heart attack, randomized to either a Mediterranean or a Western diet. And the people who ate a Mediterranean diet lived longer. This is the only study to show people live longer by eating a certain diet. It's followed over five years. Okay, what is a Mediterranean diet? This is the Mediterranean diet pyramid, right? Daily physical activity on the bottom, 30 minutes a day is what they advocate. Um, whole grains as a base for your food, whether it's couscous, polenta, wheats, uh, and then large servings of fruits, beans, nuts, and vegetables. Oil, olive oil is the base for your cooking. Uh, cheese and yogurt daily, but in small amounts. And then less frequently, fish, poultry, eggs, and sweets, and very rarely, red meat. And in this, wine in moderation, it's about two glasses a day and six glasses of water. So this is a, this is a table for it, and this is a practical guide to Mediterranean diet. If you wanted to have a Mediterranean diet and you wanted to know how to put it into action, this is a simple way to do it. Base the diet on fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. If you need snacks, either keep nuts or carrots, almonds, uh, apples, bananas. These are things with low sugar index, so they're better foods to eat. Pears also. Breakfast every day. It's part of the Mediterranean diet. You have to eat a breakfast. Most people in that diet eat yogurt for breakfast, but you can have eggs. Um, obviously, extra virgin olive oil or hummus as your, uh, as your uh, spreads, uh, and then um, whole grain bread instead of white bread. Uh, grilled fish or poultry, if you're going to use protein source, that's what they want you to eat. Uh, eating oily fish three times a week, uh, and then milk, yogurt, and cheese daily, but not in large amounts. Alcohol. This is the only study looking at alcohol and, and mortality, and I, I will keep it short. They, they group people into people who never drank and assign them an index of one. That's their relative risk. People who uh, drank but very infrequently, and they define that as less than three drinks a week. People who were former drinkers, who were, drank more than 14 drinks a week in the past. Uh, and then they grouped three different groups of people who drink regularly. So light was less than three drinks a week. Moderate was three to 14 drinks for men and three to 10 drinks for women. 
And heavy was more than 14 drinks for men, more than 10 drinks for women per week. And you can see that the light and moderate group of people had a 25% reduction in all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality. If you drink in moderation, you raise your HDL, the good cholesterol, and you live longer. The heavy drinkers, um, it was indeterminate. The line crossed over, the line of identity crossed over. So it was a wide range. Uh, so it couldn't tell if heavy drinkers were at higher risk or not at high risk. But the low people who drank lighter, moderate amounts lived longer. Yes? You hear a lot about um, benefits of red wine. Is that, is this um, beyond red wine or is this, this is all alcohol? This is beyond red wine. Um, this is, they were not restricted in what they could and could not drink. The reason to drink red wine, especially if you're, if you're thinking about it from a, um, a, a Mediterranean diet perspective, is that most um, mixed drinks or hard alcohol have, are, are sugar-based. So you have large sugar loads, which increases your insulin levels, which is not thought to be good long-term. And dry wines are not as sugary. So, so not a Riesling, but, you know, something dry like a... Like a cab or something like that. So yeah, let me go over it again. Uh, the question is, what is how we define the alcohol usage? Light alcohol was um, <clears throat> three, three drinks on average um, a week. Moderate, three to 10. Okay. Heavy for women, three to 14 for men. And heavy considered more than 10 for women and more than 14 for men, yes. What, what do you tell your clients? Oh, yes, yeah, patients. You know, a um, it's a good question. I tell them to have a glass or two of wine a day. And I don't think there's any risk to that. A bottle of wine a day, I'm not sure. But <laughs> I know, I'm only, I'm only joking too. <laughs> yes. Is this really saying that if you are a too frequent drinker or you don't drink, that you're better off? Drink? Yes. Wow. Yes, that's what it says. I will say it again. This is saying that if you are not a drinker, if you never drink, your, your risk is X. If you start to drink and you drink in the specified zones, your risk goes down by 30%, 25%. Now, that risk, that's a, that's a relative risk. Let me, let me just kind of talk about risk. The numbers seem big. Let's say... This is relative risk, so I'll just a little bit of definition between relative and absolute risk. Relative risk is a, is a term that we use that's based off absolute risk. So if your risk is 5%, and I tell you that your relative risk reduction is 25%, it's 25% of 5%, so it goes from 5% to 3.8%, whatever it is, right? So you're still at a risk of 3.8%, but it's, it's based off an absolute risk, whatever your absolute risk would be. Exercise. Um, so this is a, a group of people who are asked to classify themselves in terms of their fitness, whether they're considered to be fit or unfit. And unfit was category one, and two, two very fit category five. And for any given group of fitness, if you are unfit, men and women, you're more likely to have cardiovascular events and more likely to have your own classification. So how do you become fit? Well, exercise, obviously, and how do you do that? The results will surprise you. If you exercise at home, based on if you join a gym, you're much more likely to, A, continue the exercise, and B, lose weight. My uh, Equinox membership is literally that. <laughs> um, Most people join a gym, they go for a while, they stop going. If you incorporate exercise into your home, you're more likely to do it, although we have heard of many treadmills as a... Uh, clothing rack. So, but this is the data. The data is what the data is. I don't know what to say about it. You lose more weight if you exercise at home. Yeah, then you can exercise at home. So if you live in a studio apartment, this is what you do. This is what you do. You are more likely to lose weight and more likely to be healthy if you engage in short bouts of regular physical activity than if you plan to do one long 45-minute run. Okay? So, this is the data saying if you exercise in short bouts, you're likely to do more exercise and likely to lose more weight. So how do you do that? You make it part of your life. And this is something that, that 
uh, Googlers do a good job of. If you program your physical activity into your daily life, for example, uh, Anjali walks to work every day, then you are much more likely to keep the weight off and keep exercise. So that is a single take home point. Put exercise into your daily routine so you don't have to go somewhere to exercise. That is probably the most important thing you can do to continually exercise. Because invariably you have demands from work, home, friends, whatever, and you can't get to the gym. Because you want to get to the gym. So, you know, the uh, New York City has talked about uh, a big app that will get off two stops, one or two stops before their stop, and walk the rest of the way. So that's So, lifestyle modification for some reason. Behavior modification. Behavior techniques. Um, how do you adjust your behavior? I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but there are ways to self-monitor, which I think is very important. Uh, the ways to control your stimuli and ways to channel negative thoughts and, and uh, problem solve. So behavioral elements in terms of self-monitoring. Create a food diary and an exercise diary. Use it. Why do I say that? This is the data. They looked at four different groups of people who monitored their physical activity and their diet. So either you didn't monitor at all, monitored a little bit, monitored it sometime, monitored it all the time. And over time, people who monitored their diet and exercise fastidiously sorry, lost dramatically more weight than people who didn't monitor at all. I'm talking 30, 35 pounds. This is an example of a food diary. I showed you one. This is my food diary before I started my diet. So you can see here, um, before I started this diet, this is my, this is my breakfast. I ate a lot of crap. <laughs> Two eggs over easy on a roll with hot sauce. Not so good. Benny's chicken pod thai for lunch. Not so good. Candy. I love chocolate. So chocolate a lot for Van Leeuwen ice cream. And then my wife and I used to order out a lot for food. So either ordering food or ordering Kung Pao chicken or whatever. Um, and um, I thought nobody wanted to hear from a fat cardiologist, so I, I thought I should change what I ate. So this is my, after I saw what I was eating, this is, this is one week of a, of a three-week diary, I, I decided to change my diet based on a kind of a slow-carb diet to see what would happen. And this is my food log for the next two weeks. And, and it's basically, I'll talk about the diet offline if anyone's interested, but um, high-protein meal first thing in the morning, and I found I wasn't very hungry. So... You can see my, just tracking what I ate, um, I ate a lot less, and I was able to see it. Some people say, write it down. Some people say, put it on a Google Doc. Some people say, take a picture of everything you eat before you eat it. So you can see what you're eating. Exactly right. So in this diet, I wasn't allowed to eat certain things six days a week. And so I had a little section where I had a wish list, and that was my wish list. I wanted ice cream the first day I was on the diet. I wanted my Kit Kat the next day talk to the next day, and then by the fourth day, I didn't want anything. Um, and then I had a vice list, a list where I had, I don't know what my, my little tab is, my vice list, and my vice list is right here. Um, so I was drinking two large bottles of, of this every day, and I, when I started this diet, I thought I'd cut down to the smaller bottles. Didn't really work very well, but I did have my one vice, which I think is very important. You cannot deny yourself everything that you want, otherwise every diet is doomed to fail. So in this diet, I was able to eat I was allowed to eat whatever I wanted to eat on Saturdays. So Saturdays, the first Saturday, I had a, jala, a bagel with jalapeno cream cheese. Yeah, exactly. And then a sandwich because I wasn't allowed much bread. And then I had my Kit Kat and my ice cream. <laughs> and then I had pasta, which I also was not allowed to eat, and potatoes, which I was also not allowed to eat. So I had my cheat day, and uh, that week I lost six pounds. So the diet works. I, I don't know. This is two weeks of the diet. But the idea is you monitor everything you eat and make look at it, you're more likely to kind of be conscious of what you're doing. So that's my story on that. Um, stimulus control. I think um, this has happened at Google, I think, too. Modifying your environment to facilitate weight control. So reduce cues for overeating by eating only in a particular place. So in, in our house, we don't allow our daughter to eat anywhere but the, the dining table. And we don't, well, I don't eat anywhere but there either. I can't say that for, for everybody. If you, if, if you take stuff and put it away where you can't see it, you're unlikely to eat it. So I think, um, I think that's happened here. Uh, they've taken all the snacks that used to be everywhere and moved them to a kitchen, right? I think so you, they're not all right in front of you to eat all the time. 
Um, if you um, keep healthy food in those locations, so let's say you like to watch TV and, and you like to eat when you watch TV. If you put almonds, unsalted almonds, next to your couch, you're more likely to eat those than to eat Oreo cookies that are in the other room. Um, and give yourself a reward when you meet your certain goals. Okay, that's the idea behind my Saturdays, eating whatever I wanted. Uh, I don't know how much time I have left, probably not much, but stress reduction, I will talk a little about it. Um, stress reduction, again, multifaceted approach. Uh, the one approach that has been studied a lot in the medical literature is called the relaxation response. It's very similar to transcendental meditation. It's sitting quietly in a room, closing your eyes, focusing on a word that generally can or cannot have meaning. The idea is not to focus on the meaning of the word, but to focus on the word itself and allow your mind to kind of dive deeper. Now that you this, your mind is like an ocean, and uh, the top layer is choppy, but if you allow yourself to get underneath it, it seems quite tranquil. So if you allow yourself 20 minutes two times a day, to kind of just let whatever thought comes to you come to you by thinking of one word, not pushing thoughts out, but just letting it come to you. Uh, that's been shown to reduce blood pressure, uh, shown to reduce sugar levels, uh, and increase energy levels. Um, this is the study that looks at um, behavior therapy and risk for heart disease. And I'll just circle the conclusion. Um, a cognitive behavioral therapy approach reduces the risk of recurrent heart disease in people who have previous heart attacks. And what did they incorporate? They incorporated group therapy to discuss common stressors. So if you have something that stresses you out, find a group of people, your friends most likely, uh, who, sh who had that, those same stresses. Very easy to talk about it. If you build social networks to handle your chronic stress, you're much more likely to be able to deal with that stress. Um, and improving your interpersonal relationships by being direct and honest, instead of kind of holding on to that irritation and anger, just tell somebody, you know, I really, I really didn't like when you did that. It's much better for you and probably better for your relationship as well. Um, and then incorporating relaxation techniques Yoga, transcendental meditation, Tai Chi, anything you want. The idea is not one better than the other. The idea is something to reduce the effects of chronic stress. Um, behavior modification is well studied. That is um, a, a situation where you sit in a room, a dark room. Let's say there's something that really stresses you out. Let's say giving talks stresses you out. You sit in a dark room. You allow yourself to kind of relax your mind. You focus on thinking about a presentation you might have to give and then try to manage your response to that stress in a controlled environment, not actually giving the talk. Um, biofeedback is another way to, to deal with this. Um, biofeedback is, is a way where you have continuous kind of either visual or auditory cues uh, that kind of affect, that kind of tell you how you're responding to certain stress. So let's say um, you're in that same situation, you're thinking about a presentation you have to give, you put a a little monitor on your finger to monitor your heart rate. And you're thinking about it, and you're trying to kind of control your response, and you're getting a feedback based on the beeping of the heart rate monitor. Is it going up? OK, I have, to, I have to kind of control that. It's coming back down. I'm handling it better. Biofeedback is a way to incorporate behavioral modification. So uh, take home points before we get to um, questions. Heart disease is common in women, is often misdiagnosed, and can be fatal. Stress is a major factor in the development of heart disease, especially in women due to their multiple roles in and outside the family. And type A personalities are more likely to have stress-related cardiovascular events, as are people who have anger issues and people who are depressed. So simple steps to healthier living. Again, multifactorial approach. Mediterranean diet, the best diet for long-term health. If you don't like to eat fish or you're vegetarian, make sure you take fish or flaxseed oil on uh, a regular basis, basis provides omega-3 fatty acids you don't get elsewhere. Uh, of short-term diets, slow-carb, low-carb diets may be the most helpful in achieving desired weight loss. That's based on that one study. But long-term, you have to make sure to get enough fiber. Uh, regular physical activity is associated with improved survival, so incorporate it into your daily activities. Most important thing to do. Um, hypertension, diabetes really increases your risk for any cardiovascular event. Maintain an ideal body mass index. Body mass index calculators are available online. Just Google BMI calculator. A million of them pop up. There are specific ones for women. Um, and keep a food diary. 
The whole salt issue I didn't get to. It's very controversial whether eating a lot of salt increases your risk for having high blood pressure. Recent studies suggest that may not be the case. Um, to increase your energy levels, I didn't get to this either. Spend 15 minutes in the sun. Most people have vitamin D deficiency who live in New York, not in California, but in New York, um, especially over the winter. That leads to increased cardiovascular events and general fatigue. So if you can't be in the sun, take vitamin D. But I'd say go sit in the sun 15 minutes. Um, eat lots of garlic. If you don't like garlic and you have high cholesterol, take a garlic supplement. Garlic is a branded supplement that tastes like nothing. I've tried it. Um, take a multivitamin for all the women in this room. Multivitamin, folic acid, and selenium every day. Each one has been shown to reduce uh, cardiovascular events in women. Moderate alcohol, smoking cessation, important. I've discussed why. Uh, and then stress reduction through multifaceted approach is the best way to reduce heart risk and improve one sense of happiness. Um, I was going to play this. I can't play it. It's the Serenity Now montage from Seinfeld that I thought was really funny. Um, <laughs> And just a quick note, National Go Red for Women Day, February 3rd, 2012. Very important. Um, I am a speaker for Go Red for Women. Uh, there are guidelines coming out, reiterated guidelines for evidence-based practice for care of women with risk for heart disease and who have heart disease. Um, this is very important to everyone in this room. Uh, I wanted to thank Christy for all her help, Eileen, all your help, and to the two women in my life. Thank you very much. Um, questions, comments, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, you can call my direct line at work or my cell. Uh, I'll open up to questions. Yes, in the back. Yeah, the, the question is, um, if you're doing all the right things with diet and exercise and your, your optimal BMI, but you still feel stressed, and you're trying to do things to reduce your stress, um, what do you do? Um, and the answer is that the more things you do in a multifaceted approach to reduce your stress, the better off you are. Now, it's hard to quantify. There aren't really many studies that quantify well. If you do Tai Chi, you're going to get a 20% reduction in, in your cardiovascular events, but if you do... You do 25%, et cetera, et cetera. So you're better off saying, okay, I'm doing the right things diet wise. Exercise helps me with my stress. I need to do X, Y, and Z to deal with my stress at work or my stress at home. And, and again, those are multifactorial approaches. If you have stress at home, for example, because there are unresolved issues with you and your significant other. Direct open communication very important. Just say what it is. I, you know, I think. Um, there aren't a lot of studies to prove that. It's very hard to study that. It's a very difficult study. But in the psychology literature, that is shown, at least anecdotally, to improve interpersonal relationships. If you have stress at work, one of the nice things about uh, uh, Google is that, at least my, my impression of Google is that uh, you might have 20 minutes during the day. Have a massage. There you go. Have a massage. Meditate while you're having a massage. All right? Go for a walk. Um, lots of different things you can do. Right? Um, so I think incorporating as many of those as possible into your daily routine will make you, ha not only will it make you less stressed, it will make you happier. Sorry. Yes. Do you recommend that you still feel very stressed in terms of doing all of these things to actually see a cardiologist just to sort of avoid out? Well, 
the question is, if you still feel stressed, should you see a cardiologist uh, to rule out heart disease? I think, honestly, if you're doing all the things that you need to do and you still feel stressed, I think you have to take a, kind of a hard look at what your stressors are and if they're at all modifiable. If they're not modifiable and, and you're doing everything you can reasonably to reduce your stress that you can't reduce your stress, then it's probably not a cardiologist you need to talk to. You probably need to talk to your general physician about how to deal with stress and you know, there are many different ways to deal with stress. One, if you cannot reduce the stressor, then and you cannot find other alternatives to dealing with stress, then um, you know I, I don't like to recommend pharmacologic therapy since I'm not an expert in that area. But there are pharmacologic options to reduce stress. Uh, yes. Caffeine and heart disease studies. Yes, many studies on caffeine and heart disease. Caffeine does not necessarily promote coronary artery disease, but caffeine in large amounts does cause skip beats, extra beats, uh, and the feeling of, of palpitations, and can lead to arrhythmias, unstable heart rhythms, or stable heart rhythms from the small chambers of the heart. So drinking three of these is not really very good for you. <sighs> that's, a, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, what is too much caffeine? Um, too much caffeine is different for each person. Um, and there aren't any pre-specified numbers for caffeine like there are for sodium, like there are for sugars. Um, but if you feel the effects of caffeine, which most people can, can tell they feel, or more tellingly, if you don't have caffeine and you have effects, then you're taking too much caffeine. What I used to tell my patients when they, when they had that is to cut their caffeine intake by one drink a day for the first month. Sorry, but one drink a week for the first month. So if you're drinking, like if I, this is like, I don't know, nine cups of whatever tea, this, like two of these. So I would want to cut it to eight the first week, seven, six, and then five, and then sit there. Basically a 50% reduction in your caffeine intake generally makes you feel better. Yes? So I really like your slides, and I'd love to share these with like my friends at Vietnam. Obviously this is, this is your, uh, your uh, patented information or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> no, I'll. I'll make it available. I'll leave the the the, uh, the PowerPoint for you guys. I can PDF it or I can just leave it like this. I don't really have any problem sharing it. Yes. I heard about lipoprotein like, little A for the first time when Eileen, Anjali, and Aaron Hoffman and Dr. Alejandro Yucker. Um, yes. You guys do a really extensive cath analysis on all these tests that a lot of doctors don't test for. Mm -hmm. And um, when I spoke to Dr. Yucker, he was like, you know, this is one of the big risk factors for cardiovascular disease, and I don't hear a lot of people talking about it. And when I have spoken to other doctors, they're like, well, there's nothing you can really do about it. So I'm just curious. Yeah, there are a lot of those. Um, so the question is, what about lipoprotein little um, A? And there are a whole host of other kind of newer emerging risk factors for heart disease that are pharmacologic testing, et cetera. And there's lipoprotein little A, there's homocysteine, there's ApoB, ratios. These are all there. They're all available. The problem with most of them is we don't know whether modification of that number, that factor, leads to long-term outcome. So it's one thing to say, I have elevated life protein little a. The best example is homocysteine. People who have high homocysteine levels are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. But, and surprisingly, lowering homocysteine levels to normal with folic acid does not reduce your cardiovascular events. Right? So, on one hand, you, there's a link. On the other hand, there's not necessarily causality, right? Reducing it doesn't doesn't change your events. So that's where we are. Like, like it can be reduced by a medicine called or a, a B vitamin called niacin, right? So you can take over-the-counter niacin. Generally, will cause you to get very flushed, um, but you can take it. Uh, you can take it as your B complex vitamin, reduce your like protein little a. But um, we don't know that reducing LP little a has dramatic effects on cardiovascular events. So that link is not there yet, and that's true with a lot of these newer markers. So yes, it's a, it's a risk factor. Uh, uh, no, I wouldn't go crazy over it if you're the rest of your risk profile. But if our parents have like a history of it, then should we be concerned about that? Or well? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, if they have a history of history of elevated LP little a. Or, or a history of cardiovascular disease. Um, 
Yes and no. It depends on <laughs> depends on what kind of person you are. If you're the kind of person that will obsess over over the result and kind of worry about not and have stress from from result not being able to do anything about it, no, don't check it. But if you're not that kind of person, you want a kind of overall global risk assessment. You'll modify what you can modify. Understanding that you can never modify your risk to zero, then yes, you can check it and understand that it's part of a, a group. It's not taken by itself. It's taken as a as part of a group of, of risk modification. Yes. I am. I will, as my wife will tell you. The question is about sleep. As my wife will tell you, I'm a little sleep obsessed. I uh, I have been studying sleep uh, and how to get better sleep. And I actually sleep very well. The impact of sleep on cardiovascular disease is very well known, especially if you don't get regular sleep. You don't get to REM sleep. You don't get at least four hours sleep a night. Um, and if you if you have sleep apnea, all of those things increase your risk of cardiovascular events. Um, so um, sleep is very important. I mean, the thing I the things you read about sleep is don't bring any electronic gadgets into the bedroom. Uh, if you're going to sleep, sleep. Make the bedroom a place, you know, for sleep. Don't put a TV in the bedroom. Um, you know, don't do any of that stuff because you're going to the bed. Make it relatively a cool place, dark place. You're going there to sleep, so sleep, uh, and don't be distracted by other things. Put your phone somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, that can't be there. Don't use your computer or your bed so you can change your brain waves back to human neutral. Right, and don't do it while you're in bed trying to go to sleep. You won't sleep. No, no, it usually if you don't sleep well, it's usually from some sort of outside stressor. And, and the key is to resolve the outside stressor, and then your sleep patterns are, re, usually return back to what they were. Uh, and that doesn't have long term effects. Other questions? I think we are really, first of all, Dr. Sharma, thank you for coming in and talking about It's common sense, and I think what a lot of us, I mean, they have a condition here, so we can practice wellness um, all the time. This place is set up for healthy living, healthy eating. Yes, it's a stressful work environment in, in general, but all the conditions to stay healthy are reinforced through our uh, wellness programs, the kinds of foods that are served. There's the best fish on probably in New York. You can get on the third floor here from Kevin the Chef. And so really it's a question of mindfulness and respect for your body and paying responsibility for your wellness instead of waiting to treat illness. So thank you, Dr. Sharma, for all the intelligent That's okay. Uh, sounds good. Yes. Right. Cardiovascular events, yes, exactly right. Um, heart disease, atrial fibrillation, your um, uh, oh, a stroke. Yeah, I missed, that. I missed the big one, but I missed the big one. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned that there's some controversy around salt, because that's right now. My sister's a nutritionist, and she's a patient, and she's now managing my mother. And so she's been talking about salt if you have heart failure, salt is a must. Bring as many of those as possible into your daily routine will make you, ha not only will it make you less stressed, will make you happier. Sorry. Yes. Do you recommend that you still feel very stressed until the morning? Um, doing all the things that you do in the kitchen? And to actually see a cardiologist just to sort of avoid out heart Well, uh, the question is, if you still feel stressed, should you see a cardiologist uh, to rule out heart disease? I think honestly, if you're doing all the things that you need to do and you still feel stressed, I think you have to take a, kind of a hard look at what your stressors are and if they're at all modifiable. If they're not modifiable and, and you're doing everything you can 
reasonably to reduce your stress that you can't reduce your stress, then it's probably not a cardiologist you need to talk to. You probably need to talk to your general physician about how to deal with stress. And you know, there are many different ways to deal with stress. One, if you cannot reduce the stressor, then and you cannot find other alternatives to dealing with stress, then um, you know, I, I don't like to recommend pharmacologic therapy since I'm not an expert in that area. But there are pharmacologic options to reduce stress. Uh, yes. Caffeine and heart disease studies. Yes, many studies on caffeine and heart disease. Caffeine does not necessarily promote coronary artery disease, but caffeine in large amounts does cause skip beats, extra beats, uh, and the feeling of, of palpitations, and can lead to arrhythmias, unstable heart rhythms, or stable heart rhythms from the small chambers of the heart. So drinking three of these is not really very good for you. That's a, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, what is too much caffeine? Um, too much caffeine is different for each person. Um, and there aren't any pre-specified numbers for caffeine like there are for sodium, like there are for sugars. Um, but if you feel the effects of caffeine, which most people can, can tell they feel, or more tellingly, if you don't have caffeine and you have effects, then you're taking too much caffeine. What I used to tell my patients when they, when they had that, is to cut their caffeine intake by one drink a day for the first month. Sorry, but one drink a week for the first month. So if you're drinking, like if I, this is like, I don't know, nine cups of whatever tea, this, like two of these. So I would want to cut it to eight the first week, seven, six, and then five, and then sit there. Basically a 50% reduction in your caffeine intake generally makes you feel better. Yes? So I really like your slides, and I'd love to share them with like my friends and family. Where, I, obviously this is, this is your, uh, no, I'll I'll make it available. I'll leave the the P, the, uh, the PowerPoint for you guys. I can PDF it or I can just leave it like this. I don't really have any problem sharing it. Yes. I read about like the post in the little A for the first time when Eileen, Anjali, and Aaron talked about Dr. Alejandro Bianca. Um, yes. You guys do a really extensive panel on all these tests that a lot of doctors don't test. Mm-hmm. And um, when I spoke to Dr. Younger, he was like, you know, this is one of the big risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And I don't hear a lot of people talking about it. And when I have spoken to other doctors, they're like, well, there's nothing you can really do about it. So I'm just curious. Yeah, there are a lot of those. Um, so the question is, what about lipoprotein with um, And there are a whole host of other kind of newer emerging risk factors that are pharmacologic testing, et cetera. And there's like protein little A, there's homocysteine, there's ApoB, there's ApoB to ApoA ratios. These are all there, they're all available. The problem with most of them is we don't know whether modification of that number, that factor, leads to long-term outcome. So it's one, one thing to say, I have elevated life protein little A. The best example is homocysteine. People who have high homocysteine levels are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. But, and surprisingly, lowering homocysteine levels to normal with folic acid does not reduce your cardiovascular events, right? So on one hand, you, there's a link. On the other hand, there's not necessarily causality, right? Reducing it doesn't, doesn't change your events. So that's where we are like, like, it can be reduced by a medicine called, or a B vitamin called niacin, right? So you can take over-the-counter niacin, generally will cause you to get very flushed, um, but you can take it. Uh, you can take it as your B-complex vitamin or reduce your like, protein little a. But um, we don't know that reducing LP little a has dramatic effects on cardiovascular events. So that link is not there yet, and that's true with a lot of these newer markers. So yes, it's a, it's a risk factor. Uh, uh, no, I wouldn't go crazy over it if you're the rest of your risk profile. But if our parents have like a history of it, then they have a better chance of yeah, it's a good question. Um, if they have a history of history of elevated LP little a, or just or, a history of cardiovascular. Um, yes and no. It depends on <laughs> depends on what kind of person you are. If you're the kind of person that will obsess over over the result and kind of worry about not and have stress from from result not being able to do anything about it, no, don't check it. But if you're not that kind of person, you want a kind of overall global risk assessment. You'll modify what you can modify. Understanding that you can never modify your risk to zero, 
then yes, you can check it and understand that it's part of a, a group. It's not taken by itself. It's taken as a as part of a group of, of risk modification. Yes. I am. I will, as my wife will tell you. The question is about sleep. As my wife will tell you, I'm a little sleep obsessed. I uh, I have been studying sleep uh, and how to get better sleep. And I actually sleep very well. The impact of sleep on cardiovascular disease is very well known, especially if you don't get regular sleep. You don't get to REM sleep. You don't get at least four hours sleep a night. Um, and if you if you have sleep apnea, all those things increase your risk of cardiovascular events. Um, so um, sleep is very important. I mean, the thing I the things you read about sleep is don't bring any electronic gadgets into the bedroom. Uh, if you're going to sleep, sleep. Make the bedroom a place, you know, for sleep. Don't put a TV in the bedroom. Um, you know, don't do any of that stuff because you're going to the bed. Make it relatively a cool place, a dark place. You're going there to sleep, so sleep, uh, and don't be distracted by other things. Put your phone somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, that can't be there. Don't use your computer if you are on the floor bed. It will change your brain waves back to human neutral. Right, and don't do it while you're in bed trying to go to sleep. You won't sleep. Well, I mean, that's not sleep. Does that have to have a longer term, you know, effect on you, or is it once you sleep again, you're in bed? No, no. Usually, if you don't sleep well, it's usually from some sort of outside stressor. And, and the key is to resolve the outside stressor, and then your sleep patterns are re usually return back to what they were. Uh, and that doesn't have long-term effects. Other questions? I think we are really crystal, Dr. Sharma. Thank you for coming in and talking about it. It's common sense, and I think what a lot of us, I mean, they have a condition here, so we just practice wellness um, all the time. This place is set up for healthy living, healthy eating. Yes, it's a stressful work environment in, in general, but all the conditions to stay healthy are reinforced through our uh, wellness programs, the kinds of foods that are served. There's the best fish on probably in New York. You can get them third floor here from Kevin the chef. And so really it's a question of mindfulness and respect for your body and taking responsibility for your wellness instead of waiting to treat illness. So thank you, Dr. Sharma, for all the intelligence. That's okay. Uh, sounds good. Yes. Right. Cardiovascular events, yes, exactly right. Um, heart disease, atrial fibrillation, your um, uh, oh, a stroke. Yeah. And I missed that. I missed the big one, but I missed the big one. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned that there's some controversy around salt, because that's right now. Like, my sister's a nutritionist, and she doesn't eat fresh stuff. And so she's now managing my mother. And so I have my mother, but she has to learn to eat salt. If you have heart failure, 